Hello, everyone. I'm Jason Chung, president of eHorizon and eSports Council at Zuber Lawler. I'm also an educator and I lead the nation's first eSports business degree programs at an AACSB accredited business school at the University of New Haven. And uh, what is eHorizon, you may ask? Well, eHorizon is your partner as you navigate the complex world of eSports business. We offer three pillars of support to you, including consulting, where we help, we help you navigate complex issues such as compliance, marketing, and acquisitions in eSports. Talent, where we help match together organizations and leaders seeking to enter the esports industry. And Connect, where we host insightful webinars, roundtables, and conferences so you can learn from and connect with other leaders in the industry. And this is a eHorizon Connect event. Check us out at eHorizon.gg and let's see how we can dominate esports together. With that, I'd like to introduce our webinar topic as part of our eHorizon Connect series. Uh, this uh, webinar is called The Cost of Counterfeiting Esports. As esports goes increasingly mainstream, many esports organizations and brands are attempting to leverage their IP and open up new revenue streams such as merchandising. However, the merch space is rife with different channels and competitors, and not all are on the up and up. So, what can esports boards and brands do to protect themselves? Where's all this headed? Our moderator and panelists are experts on the topic and able to guide you through what works and what doesn't. So, without further ado, I'd like to go right to our amazing panel. And to lead this panel, I'd like to introduce uh, Nate Fintz of uh, Zuber Lawler, who's the moderator of today's panel. Nate. Thank you very much, Jason. And welcome, everybody. It's great to have you here. Um, so I'll just jump right in. We've got some great panelists here today. They've got some really up-close perspectives on the industry. And it's an industry where merch is playing an increasing role uh, in revenue stream and otherwise. And sadly, where there's merch, there's often counterfeiting. And here's the first prompt that I'd like to throw out to the group here. Let's paint a picture of the problem. Uh, with regard to counterfeiting, what problems are you seeing, both current problems that you see today, and how do you see things going forward? How do you see things de uh, developing? What anticipated problems do you see changing or cropping up in the future? And let's see if we can paint a great picture, a uh, full picture of the, you know, the what, where, who, and why of this pressing issue. Uh, why don't we start with Duncan? Hi, uh, my name is Duncan Stanley. I'm the account director at Evolved uh, Talent Agency. Um, outside of the talent representation, we do a lot of uh, consulting across the esports space. Um, uh, my particular area of expertise is merchandising um, on the uh, manufacturing and vendor side. So I uh, work with a variety of esports team and game companies and leagues and publishers to manufacture their merchandise for live events, for their teams, for their fans on their web store. And um, just over the years have uh, dealt with almost every issue on that side of the space, you know, from counterfeiting to, you know, uh, customs duties when you're shipping internationally to pr local production all over the globe. Um, so that's really uh, my role here is on the, uh, the, nuts and bolts day-to-day -day side of the manufacturing of said merch. And what have you been seeing uh, in terms of the counterfeiting problem? What, what, is, what does the problem look like from, from the perspective of being involved with such a prominent talent agency in the field and being involved with such an uh, important uh, swag entity? In, sure, in so what we, what we see on the counterfeiting side specifically is, um, we haven't seen a lot of straight up counterfeiting in the United States of esports teams exactly. Now, globally, absolutely. If you if you go to other countries that you know Asia and South America, where where um, you know have huge esports scenes around certain teams and certain games, there is that. Not as much in the United States, with notable exceptions of kind of the lifestyle teams like Hundred Thieves or Phase, for example, um, that really have like a brand recognition outside of. Uh, esports. Um, I have seen, you know, if I live in LA, so I see a lot of that counterfeiting, you know, people wearing bootleg um, merch. I can, as a merch guy, I can usually tell bootleg stuff um, from a, a block away. That's changing. Um, sometimes it's incredibly good. Sometimes it's made by the exact same people that made the real stuff. Um, so definitely have seen that, you know, live events are still, well, except for the pandemic, um, we're typically the huge place to uh, move merchandise to the fans because there's 30, 50,000 people in one place, all super fans, all there to buy merch. So they're sellers on the street, just like you have at Yankee games, you know, or Lakers games selling that merchandise on the, on the sidewalk. Um, even if it's not a replica, it's, you know, just got the, you know, the name of the game on it or something like that. So 
that's happening. Um, also online, you know, you see, uh, you know, uh, places like Zazzle and some other Amazon uh, selling, um, you know, bootleg merch because people, it, there's no barrier to entry to just throwing up a store, running some, you know, with direct garment printing, there's not even an inventory risk anymore. And you just start selling that merchandise. And so, you know, brand protection is uh, definitely an important part of counter, you know, countering counterfeiting. And how would you say that this affects the, uh, the uh, players and the entities and the teams and the streamers that, that you work with? Um, it definitely impacts their bottom line, right? Because, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, merchandise is not a solved problem for streamers uh, just due to a scaling problem. But for esports, it sort of is, right? You know, they're, they are the size of, you know, real sports, you know, traditional sports teams, not real, traditional sports teams. And... You know, they've got their web stores, they've got their, you know, brand partners like, you know, Puma and Adidas and, and Champion, and they're making merchandise together. And you're starting to see some, you know, bootleg cross-branded merch. And it affects their bottom line because, you know, they the, the entities are seeing zero of the dollars that are flowing through Amazon or, or Zazzle or those other websites that, you know, they're not seeing any of them versus, you know, they're not going to the store. And when people buy bootleg merch on Amazon and it's a bad experience because it's not good merch, they don't necessarily blame Amazon or the, the bootlegger. They blame the streamer for not having good merch. And that's that's a problem. Right, right. It is a big problem. I'd like mm -hmm. to move now to Adrian, if I may. Adrian, and uh, forgive me, Duncan, I didn't prompt you to introduce yourself when you started talking, but you did anyway, so glad you did. Uh, Adrian, uh, please um, um, introduce yourself and... Uh, uh, you have some really, really heavy hitting experience in this industry. Um, so I think everyone would be very interested to hear uh, your your perspective and whether you agree or disagree with Duncan and what, what you're seeing uh, about this problem. Sure. Uh, so hi, my name is Adrian Gale. Um, I'm VP of Merchandising and Licensing um, at Cloud9 Esports. Um, if you don't know, we're one of the, I mean, Duncan talked about the life on the lifestyle side, we're, we're one of the, you would one of the top um, endemic, truly endemic esports organizations in North America. Um, we've got a really rich history in competitive esports across a number of gaming titles. Um, we have two franchise uh, teams um, in the LCS, the League of Legends, and we're the reigning uh, current champions. Um, about to head to MSI. Um, you know, we're excited about that. And then uh, we have an Overwatch team, uh, London Spitfire, that we also own um, as a franchise league, plus we um, you know, very vested in Valorant and uh, R6 in Korea. Um, uh, plus, we have a number of content creators and pro player streamers um, across multiple platforms, as gaming platforms as well. So, you know, we, we're one of the few orgs that has a really broad um, cross section of games that we compete in. Um, and with that, we have a pretty, you know, large fan base as a result. I mean, it's very, very league centric, but we have a, because that's that's where how the org started initially. But, um, you know, our, our, our overall fan base um, is is really broad. And as a result, um, there is a lot of demand, a lot of, lot of fan demand for our merch, right? And we have evolved, um, especially over the last couple of years with our partnership with Puma um, to, you know, go from just selling jerseys and t-shirts to really evolving into, you know, creating proper lifestyle collections um, that do resonate with, the, the mainstream fan and hopefully um, lower the barrier of entry or, the, or, or, the, or, or increase um, one brand visibility for esports as a whole, but also just, just curiosity around esports because distribution is a little broader through Puma, right? Um, what I'm seeing uh, on the, I mean, on the, on the, you know, the issue at hand, um, you know, where I, you know, I, I look, I agree with Duncan that, you know, that the, the barrier to entry is really low. I think the other challenges are for a lot of the, a lot of the new, I mean, esports is such a new industry, right? And so there really isn't a lot of IP history. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the orgs, um, especially the newer orgs, I mean, they're all newer orgs, right? But a lot of the newer orgs, you know, they haven't got a lot of, they haven't got a long track record in terms of trademarking, you know, and, and, and they haven't been able to establish, you know, the historical, um, you know, protection. Um, the, the access, um, especially for fans and, and like Duncan said, you know, outside of North America, the access to a jersey or a t-shirt is limited, but, and distribution is also limited. Um, but the, but, but on the flip side, it's very easy to copy, 
and and even more so, you know, as as orgs evolve their merchandising business, you know, the jerseys and the and the garments that they're making aren't very complex, and so they're very so as a result they're very easy to copy as well. Um, and and here, you know, therein lies the issue, right? Where where it actually does a counterfeit esports jersey is very very it's very very easy to counterfeit an esports jersey and make it feel almost as authentic as the real deal because they're really there really isn't a whole lot of complexity in building an esports jersey at this point. Um, yeah, so that's, I mean, there are my observations outside of what Duncan, and I, I wholeheartedly agree with what Duncan said in terms of distribution challenges. Um, Amazon is, you know, a ton of bad, you know, North America, a ton of bad actors on Amazon that we're, we're, we're you know, we've got strategies in place to protect, the, to protect ourselves. I think that the one um, area of, of, of advantage that we have over pretty much all of the esports orgs in North America is, is our partnership with Puma, which really allows us to double down on our IP protection because, because of the, the, the official partnership with them, they're able to go out and, and, and you know, and, and track and, you know, search and destroy on, on, on counterfeited product um, out there in the space as well. You're, I'm, I'm glad that you uh, raised the issue of your partnership with Puma because that is especially, um, I personally find that especially interesting. I, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more to tell our audience about what, what uh, the thought process was um, that went into your, your decision to, to, to do this partnership and what the experience was like before you were in the partnership and what, what the experience is like being in the partnership because I think that that, that provides in and of itself, two different yeah. kind of perspectives. I mean, it's it's. I mean, you look at it from two fr from both sides of the fence, right? Puma saw esports, you know, like like Nike, with, like Nike's with, with the LPL and some of their sponsorships with Adidas, with sponsoring G two esports in um, and and Dam One Kia um, in 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 their regions. Um, you know, Puma, you know, saw an opportunity to you know you know capture a, a young evolving you know fast-paced audience in esports right and and i think puma definitely look at opportunities in different um sporting categories that other um sporting goods brands don't haven't ventured you know and i really think that puma has been a, a real pioneer in um supporting esports i mean especially with us but in terms of trying to evolve product and innovate in the space um so that from their perspective, that's why they, you know, wanted to get in the esports space, um, partnering with us. I mean, obviously we give them, um, you know, a lot of uh, global brand, you know, we, we we're, able, we're able to spread, you know, our brand ID and our brand as a, as a, as a global brand, even though it's North America based is pretty prevalent. Um, so we're able to give them, um, you know, more reach. And um, I mean, from our perspective, the partnership was, Obviously, one, you know, there, there's, a, there's a sponsorship element to it, which is really important, um, you know, and, and that helps, obviously, you know, their, their, their financial support helps us, you know, pay for player salaries and house them and fly them places and support infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. But um, on, the, on the selling side, you know, having a merchandise partner like Puma means that we're able to level up our product overall or able to delve into categories that we wouldn't have done in the, in, in the past, like bags and accessories, footwear, um, technical footwear, technical garments. Um, and on the brand, on the brand IP side, um, you know, I mean, jerseys, jerseys as, as a one, as one case in point, I mean, you know, using proprietary materials like dry cell um, on the Puma jerseys, you know, adding holographic tags or adding, um, you know, authentic, um, uh, tagging on the product um, is able to create a, create a, create a, you know, a, a, a clear a differentiation between what we would we would offer out there in the space versus the other esports orgs, and it's much harder to counterfeit, much harder to copy. Um, that I mean that on the count on the counterfeit side, but overall, I mean having a partner having a partnership, I think it legitimizes esports as a whole by having mainstream sportswear brands like Puma sponsoring teams um, and. You know they've been a great supporter on a lot of levels, and you know even from a marketing and a mainstream um, PR element, you know they're 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 they're, they're pushing esports into mainstream, you know broader um, marketing channels and media channels, distribution channels. I mean you know you can buy a pair of Cloud Nine Puma sneakers on Foot Locker, you can buy Cloud Nine T-shirts at PacSun. Um, you know we wouldn't 
we would, it'd be very, very challenging for, for, for an esports org to go out there on their own and actually try and broaden distribution like that. Thank you. Um, there's one, one other quick point that I was wondering if you could address, which is um, uh, my understanding is that uh, you've got a major, a major following in Brazil. Um, yeah. So we have, we have a, yeah, we have a huge following in Brazil. Uh, the, the, the bulk of our Fortnite team is Brazilian based uh, and they've got, they, they, as individuals have huge followings. Um, we have um, had other um, uh, league players and league streamers um, previously from Brazil. Um, our, you know, I mean, you know, our, our brand ambassador, Mateus Portillo, our, um, you know, our social media manager that, that has, a, has a lot of fame and notoriety in, in the esports space himself is Brazilian. Um, so we, we have a lot of engagement with our Brazilian fans. Um, it's a very interesting space in terms of, you know, while we don't have, you know, outside of our Fortnite team, we don't have um, other teams there. We have a huge overall brand following and, um, you know, challenges of, you know, the challenge of being able to actually import authentic product into Brazil is, you know, damn near impossible. Right. Um, and so it just, it just opens the door for, for, right. um, you know, counterfeiting and, and it's just very, very, very hard to police. Right. I mean, right. we've, you know, the street vendor, the street vendor business and, and like I've seen jerseys on street, you know, counterfeit C9 jerseys from 2018, 2019 right. that look, you know, really, really close to the real deal, you know, and we, we know, you know, they're fake because there's no way that we printed that player's name on the back of the jersey at any one time. Right. But, right. you know, it, it, they're showing up and, um, you know, South America, you know, with, with, with you know, anti-dumping, you know, anti-dumping laws um, and, and, you um, you know, essentially, you know, not allowing for brands to import into the country. Um, you know, in my experience from the action sports industry, particularly as well, where, you know, very, very hard to, you know, skateboarding is another example of how big it is in Brazil. It's impossible for, for endemic skateboard brands to import their product into Brazil. And so that's, that's kind of like the, the, the learning that I have about how hard it is and how rife it is for counterfeit. Mm. Eric. <laughs> Thank you, Adrian. Derek, I think now is a great time to switch gears a little bit uh, to someone who is who uh, works not only with the with the uh, esports industry, but but with the or <laughs> against the counting in against the counterfeiting industry in general, if I may. Uh, uh, Derek, I know that uh, you and I work together all the time, but uh, would you uh, introduce yourself to the audience and tell about the awesome work you do and the problems as you see them from your unique perspective. Yeah, absolutely, Nate, and thanks for having us today. Um, so my name is Derek Manlepeg. I'm one of the partners here at Vantage UP, and uh, we have an automated brand protection solution that basically covers over 173 global e-commerce marketplaces. And uh, yeah, we basically help some of the world's biggest brands. And one of the biggest brands we're currently helping in esports right now is FaZe Clan. And uh, we actually have seen a growing trend of counterfeit issues across all regions. Um, actually, funny enough, Adrian, you bring up um, South America. Uh, we're seeing on Mercado Libre, one of the biggest South American marketplaces, um, period, massive counterfeits are flooding the market and none of it's authentic product. It's just crazy how it's growing. Um, but really with on a higher level, we're seeing three major issues um, currently in esports, uh, especially with counterfeiting. You know, one of those issues is obviously China, right? We're seeing manufacturers that are producing the product um, and it's not even good products, not even good jerseys. It's just t-shirts, it's hats, it's flags. It's easy to produce product um, that they can make in a second, right? No problem at all. It's ending up on Alibaba. It's ending up on wholesale marketplaces that basically third-party resellers from the United States are buying in bulk. And then when they buy that in bulk, what happens? It comes into the United States. Now it ends up on eBay. It ends up on Amazon. It ends up on Walmart. And now fans are buying it. Okay, lost revenue again for these esports teams. Um, and yeah, I agree with with Duncan that you know it is the bigger teams that have invested in branding and merchandising that are having the biggest issues. Um, but we are seeing like isolated players where you know if you type their name in on some of these you know do-it-yourself design marketplaces like Redbubble, Teespring, Tier Public, Zazzle, you're seeing a couple listings come up, and they're only going to continue to grow. Right? It's a it's a massive issue. And, um, and then second from domestic marketplaces it is those do-it-yourself, you know, the fans uploading designs of merch, uploading designs of logos, upside, uploading designs of photos of the players themselves, and they're basically able to sell products without even making the inventory. And that's what's so crazy about these new marketplaces. You can literally upload a design and drop ship a product straight to a con another consumer without even producing the product yourself. 
right? And it's that ease of access that a lot of these new teams are having major issues with. And we're seeing, I mean, stuff from NRG, Team Liquid, TK, TSM, all of these teams are starting to have growing issues and it's only gonna to continue to get worse. Um, and I also, I think to an early point with Adrian said is, um, you know, these teams need to start building their IP portfolios. A lot, of, a lot of times they're coming to us and they don't actually have the right IP in place to be able to enforce these types of things, right? So get your trademarks in line, get your copyrights in line, start considering registering these intellectual property things in different countries like China so that you can get ahead of the problem once it arrives, right? And once you build a really strong IP portfolio, then yeah, of course, you know, you can force yourself or you can use a service like us where we can basically scan these marketplaces, look for these things and file these enforcement things at scale. Um, but again, it starts with having a strong IP foundation and then going into enforcement. Thank you, Derek. Um, and uh, if, if, uh, if I could, um, could, I, could I just ask you uh, to give a few just basic stats about like, uh, you know, how to sort of illustrate the size of the problem, both in terms of numbers and geographic scope? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I mean, just in terms of scope on these do-it-yourself marketplaces, I believe this last year we removed close to 72,000 listings. Um, and not, in, not even just in esports, but across like artists in general. Um, it's just, a, it's a massive issue. In esports alone, the last six months, we've probably removed close to 36,000 infringing counterfeit product listings. Um, Amazon, eBay, again, Redbubble, Teespring, Tier Republic, uh, Alibaba, Mercado Libre, another growing marketplace. Um, but I also, the third issue I wanted to bring up is that we're seeing a lot of these teams get impersonated on social media platforms. Fake Instagram accounts that are impersonating the players, fake Facebook groups that are trying to be the teams. And in these channels, they are funneling sales. They're trying to sell merch. They're trying to get people to believe that there's a giveaway that the player is running and they're taking their credit card and they're running with it. It's a scam. It's crazy. I mean, it's not even just marketplaces. Now it's even moving to social media and that's where we see the new trend is happening and we're trying to get ahead of it. You know, and it does require building some, you know, really good scanning technology that can scan these things, search the hashtags, search the player's names, search the team's names, look for these impersonating accounts and getting ahead of it and removing it. But again, if you don't have that IP foundation in place, you're not going to be able to do it, right? There is some things you can do with copyright, but if you don't have the trademarks, I mean, you, you, it's just, you're kind of a lost cause. So really get ahead of it. You know, even though if you don't have a problem now, be preventative, build that IP portfolio. So in a year when your team does win the championship, you'll be ready. And then at that point, you'll be able to make your own revenue off your own merchandise rather than people stealing it from you, right? Very important. Absolutely, crucially important. And and since you since you and your, you know, from my perspective, magical software uh, uh, functions uh, without regard to geographic borders, um, can you can you give us any sort of can you paint a picture in terms of, you know, where the problem is worse or better or where it's getting worse or you know, is it, I mean, I'm 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 assuming that you're going to say Asia is a bigger sore spot, but it's getting worse here too. Yeah, I'd say the biggest in terms of total listing volume of total things that we removed, it is those do-it-yourself marketplaces because that's where the fans are going to, right? The fans are going to these marketplaces. They're saying, oh, I want to make my own shirt. So I'm uploading the, you know, the phase logo. I'm uploading the Cloud9 logo. I throw it on Redbubble. I throw it on T-Spring. I throw it on T-Republic, whatever. And I'm buying it for myself. But in turn, I'm also selling it to other people. It's flagrant. It's awful, right? It just, it's happening. And it's actually the fans that are starting to fuel some of this stuff, but again, the team's gonna get ahead of it, right? And, and obviously we don't wanna take action against fans. Fans are great, fans make revenue, we wanna keep the fans happy, but we also wanna make sure that they understand that there is IP that exists and they have to do some things legally. And yeah, we would love collaboration with them, but if they are making money off producing a product that is not theirs, you know, benefiting from a team that they don't have IP to, they can't do it, right? And that's why you really need to build education with these fans and say, hey, look guys, like this is where you buy the real stuff. These are the authorized sellers. These are the unauthorized sellers. If you really want to truly support the players and the teams, this is how you can do it, right? And fans mostly, when you say that, they're like, okay, great. This is, we're, we're game, right? They understand. So definitely a lot of education is I think needed in this space, um, period. Great, thank you so much, Derek. Your, your, your perspective is I think quite unique. Um, We've been we've been trotting out a parade of horribles here, trying to explain to people and paint a very grim picture of how big the problem is and what's happening. I think I'd like to change gears a little bit and try to change the arc of this conversation and say, what have you been doing uh, that works? Um, and I guess you could also mention what you've been doing that doesn't work um, in terms of solutions. How do we fight this problem? Um, and I think it might make sense to start with, uh, with Adrian, uh, especially because he's, he's got that perspective of, uh, 
uh, doing it within a sponsorship context and doing it not yet being in a sponsorship context. Yep, thanks. So, um, I mean, threefold. One, um, we, you know, we've adopted a similar, you know, to, to probably a similar platform to, what, to, 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 to where Derek is at, um, to police, you know, you know, an online police trafficking um, platform that we go that so that we'll, we'll set we'll set criteria, um, and they will essentially search and destroy um, or flag uh, any counterfeit items that they come across, um, and then we'll go in periodically and vet, um, you know, vet anything that's been flagged that hasn't been automatically, um, uh, you know targeted essentially and, and, and notified um, for takedown. Um, the other area where we have um, put some focus into is Amazon, um, considering the level of um, either counterfeit, um, you know, counterfeited product, or I would even argue gray products, you know, like product that's actually sort of found its way through arbitrage, you know, back onto Amazon again, that was bought say through our store. Um, the way that we've way we address that is, I mean, like you know, we if you, if if you're if you're a brand and you want to, and if you're not selling on Amazon directly, um, they're not really going to do put too much energy into helping you. So um, we we set up our own Amazon store um, late last year. Um, we um, the approach that we took is that we actually reissued old product from 2018 2019 um, using um, unique SKU numbers and ASIN numbers. So the only thing that's actually available that, that's, that's authentic has its own ASIN on Amazon. Um, and so anything else that pops up that might be like for live, you can immediately flag as being counterfeit because it doesn't have that ASIN. Um, and, then, um, and then the other, the other out area is, you know, Puma, Puma are hosting our product on, um, on Amazon. Um, and so we're allowing them to, to steer the ship for the, from a Puma Cloud9 perspective on Amazon. We're not selling, we're not selling Puma on there and we're allowing them to, to manage um, any kind of fitting issues or any issues that they, so we're, we're, we're essentially kind of like, you know, a two headed beast, right? So we're, we're, we're attacking from, from the left, they're attacking from the right in terms of counterfeiting um, of our brand and our logo on Amazon. Um, and and it, it is, we feel it's been relatively successful to date where we have been able to really kind of mitigate um, especially on the, on the U S side. I mean, we are, there are uh, your, the European Amazon sites, things are showing up still, but we have really done a good job of mitigating. Um, if anything, they're, they're getting to a point where they're actually flagging like um, authentic product. I mean, and there is, there is an element of like flagging on eBay as well. And a lot of the authentic product is showing up on eBay as, as our distribution broadens Puma, you know, Puma, um, you know, people are buying Puma stuff and, you know, putting on an Amazon doc or putting on an eBay. And so uh, we're getting to that. We're getting down to the bottom of the barrel in terms of like, they're actually searching out eBay now instead of actually like, you know, Amazon or Zazzle or uh, some of the other, some of the other web websites. So that's been our approach today. Um, and it's worked. Um, but, you know, I guess not all orgs have the appetite or the, or the, the, uh, you know, the ability in terms of bandwidth to be able to set up an Amazon store and run that in, 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 in parallel with their own, e-commerce right so um therein lies the challenge i think for a lot of the emerging orgs and and what was the experience like before you were in in the sponsorship was it was it dramatically different yeah um i, I mean I, I i came in i came in just as we'd signed the deal so i don't have a lot of history but my but my, but, but but you know there was there we, we had we essentially had a had a slack channel um, in, in our or, or, or team's channel um, uh, internally where we would essentially, you know, if, if, we, if we, you know, through discovery, if we found counterfeit stuff somewhere, we would flag it um, and then we would have, our, have, our, have people go out and, and nullify it essentially. But that was, you know, pretty, pretty arduous, pretty block and tackle versus being getting ahead of it. Um, that's what we were doing previously. So, you know, we, we've really got, gotten out really tried to get out in front of, of ip protection in the last six to eight months primarily um to to protect ourselves as the brand as the brand grows and i i just want to go back to just uh, very quickly before we, we move on i just want to go back to something you said before which is very interesting about uh the simplicity of the jerseys and how they're that makes them easy potentially easier to yeah to rip off. are you aware of, of any movement within the industry to try to 
you know, intentionally make things more complex. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think from some of the orgs, um, you know, some, some of the other teams are definitely leveling up their jersey quality or their jersey complexity to make it much more identifiable in terms of being authentic versus being counterfeit. Um, so it, it, it is happening, but I think, you know, once again, it's accessibility, right? And it's also speed to market. The, the, the fast pace of esports often outstrips the ability for, 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 for orgs to be able to work with larger factories or, 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 or factories that demand probably a eight month lead time or, or a 12 month you know, production lead time on the jersey design. Mm -hmm. um, and also call for large quantities, uh, you know, large MOQs in order to hit, to, to hit that production versus a lot of the, the, you know, a lot of the locally, the, the locally sourced jerseys on sublimated, you know, poly that are much easier. One, one, they're quick turn. You can turn a, turn a jersey in two weeks and there really isn't a huge minimum. So it's, it's, it's risk, it's risk reward for them, you know, because they're, they're, they're obviously trying to sort of, you know, move, move with the pace of their brand demand as their brand grows, but also, you know, obviously mitigate risk on an inventory or any like, you know, upfront commitments on investing into something that they're not, not sure if they're going to sell them all. Right. So, I mean, we're in a different place where we can kind of, you know, leverage Puma and we have a pretty good, you know, run rate on how many jerseys we would sell in a, in a quarter or, 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 or biannually. So we can forecast to that, but, new orgs don't really have that that back history to be able to forecast um so i think they're the challenges um so you'll see some of the more established orgs that have a good understanding of what how many jerseys i think they'll sell in a year you know they'll level up their product but i think some of the new orgs are going to have a hard time just because they're just not willing to take the risk right sure. yet another way in which this industry is different from most other industries yeah. um duncan thank you so much adrian um Duncan, uh, I, I was wondering if you could uh, uh, share a little bit about the things that you see people trying to do to combat this problem. And uh, I know that you work closely with, with talent of various stripes, players, teams. So, yeah, I know you work with brands and I know you, you know, obviously you're, you're a merch guy in more yeah. ways than one. <clears throat> sure. So, um, you know, some things that, uh, you know, Adrian covered a lot of it for sure. You know, the RFID tags, you know, checking, uh, partnering with like a global, you know, uh, brand that has, you know, incredibly strong uh, brand protection uh, scheme like, you know, Puma or, you know, Champion or whatever, you know, those brands are heavily invested in their brand protection. So that's, you know, a great way, but, you know, that's absolutely not available to most teams. It's only available, you know, to the, you know, the top teams like Cloud9. Um but, you know, things that are not terribly expensive or complicated to do um, because, you know, most esports teams aren't moving, you know, hundreds of thousands of jerseys a year or shirts. They're just, you know, that that market isn't really there. You know, when they do events, sure, that's, you know, they can move thousands in a day. But typically it's not, you know, moving that much on the web um, or combating that. And so um, one thing some of my clients have been doing is... Um, well, let's back up. Most jerseys are uh, dye sublimated, direct to, direct to garment printing. They're typically soccer jerseys that are just designed to look like what you think of as an esports jersey, and that has changed a little bit. Meta Threads is a, a you know a company that's manufactured most esports jerseys over the years, and they have an innovative double collar, and they do a couple of design things that are harder to replicate. Um, and uh, but you know, for teams that don't want to have the distinctive you know, double collar look that says we bought meta threads, they have their own designs and they add other physical elements to it, like sewn on patches that are more expensive to make in smaller quantities. So uh, most counterfeiters that are doing things on a very small scale, it's not worth it because they're like, you know, they don't want to pay almost, you know, a buck or two for the Jersey and then $3 for $5 for the patch to then sew on. So that's an easy way that a lot of um, my clients have, have been, you know, leveling up to make and it, it look cooler, you know, having a physical patch, you know, on the sleeve or on the left chest, um, you know, that's, that's pretty cool. But also that runs into a problem be, where a lot of the leagues uh, have very specific uniform requirements about the jerseys. And you can't do that with an official like League of Legends team jersey that's yours. You have to do it on kind of the generic Cloud9 jersey, you know. 
um, yeah. or any other team. And so that's just kind of a, a little bit of a challenge. But, you know, um, thing, you know, RFID tags, distinctive packaging, um, you know, hologram labels, all of these things, you know, they're relatively easily defeated, but it always continually increased the costs of counterfeiters in making that merch. Um, one other thing that I've seen be successful is um, working with, uh, you know, places like Brazil and Europe is having a, a sales and distribution center there. Like for North American teams, they're mostly popular in North America, so they don't really worry about it. But sometimes they'll pick up, you know, a French Rocket League team, for example. The Rocket League team will be French and live in France. And then all of a sudden they have a French following, but their headquarters is in L.A., People are, don't want to pay $40 in shipping. And so all of a sudden they're getting counterfeit stuff made in France. What do they do? Uh, in that case, they will work with like a, a European, you know, French or somewhere merch partner that is it local, will shelf stop goods. And then all of a sudden they're catching up because people don't need to bootleg that merchandise. They can buy it in that region and country. And same thing in, in Asia and, you know, uh, you know uh, Australia and New Zealand as well. And so that's something that that helps combat it is let your fans buy the merchandise uh, you want now that 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 they want to buy from you because I guess you know most fans would want to buy it direct but they don't have the opportunity or it's way too expensive to buy it direct so um, you know with shipping and stuff so they'll you know find it any way they can to show their support um, Brazil as Adrian pointed out huge problem uh, you can't really import goods into uh, Brazil um, at all. I one time sent my secret Santa a, a, a Adidas a soccer jersey. That's like just a, a, a joke. There's a German soccer jersey because they beat Brazil. Uh, he ended up getting like a $200 US customs duty for like a $30 uh, jersey. So Brazil is a huge problem. You got to work with local uh, manufacturers there. And that has its own problems because a lot of places around the country will do that gray market. They'll do it a, a second shift of running your product to move it out under their own, um, you know, under their own uh, bottom line. But, you know, there's ways around that with vendor agreements and, you know, uh, uh, you know, having those vendor agreements and tracking and penalizing them. If they do that, you know, sure, that just adds to the cost of you trying to do that merch. So it is, it is challenging um, for people to do that, but um Outside of the physical manufacturing of merch, you know, high, higher quality goods, paying for better stuff, because when someone sees a real, you know, 14 ounce heavyweight uh, hoodie, they'll be like, oh, wow, this like, you know, six ounce one I got off Zazzle or whatever doesn't compete at all. The embroidery is terrible. Uh, it doesn't have the fine details of, you know, the, the antiqued eyelets on that kind of stuff. And spending time in production on that stuff really makes a difference and fan, you know, fans don't want to be made fun of by their friends for buying what's clearly bootleg merch. So a lot of ways to combat that. Thank you. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, there's, there's, there's another, uh, there's one other angle that I was I'm wondering if, if, if Duncan, you could uh, briefly touch on and, you know, since, since evolved uh, reps, a lot of uh, prominent players, I was wondering if you have any insight into how, you know, just looking at things from the player perspective specifically, since players, you know, own their own gamer tags. Um, and, you know, have you seen any players um, mount an effective effort uh, to fight counterfeiting on their own or, you know, pitching into the effort? Or is that um, really... I've, I've seen, you know, usually when, when a new merch line drops or the team is doing well, um, you know, kind of contractually, the... the you know, the, the players will boost the sales to the merchandise. Some, some don't typically most players are fairly non-active on social media. Um, it's just, they're focused on, on playing games and being the best that they can be. And so um, in my experience, most players aren't super involved in the merchandise sales. And that's part of contractually with a lot of teams, they're removed um, from it almost entirely. They just, as players, they, they don't, see a lot of you know even revenue with their with it you know if, if a certain player's jersey sells better most of the time that player doesn't see any of that money outside of you know they might get a couple percent of global you know overall merch sales and even that's where like uh, contracts i've seen i haven't seen a ton of contracts but um you know most players don't really care 
I mean, they see their fans in the stands wearing their, their tag. Yeah. They're very happy about that, but they're, you know, I, I can't think of any time when a, when a, a player said, Hey, don't buy bootleg merch, buy it on the official store. They'll say, Hey, we got new jerseys out. I'm so happy to be here. You know, check out, I'm happy to join the team. My new Jersey, isn't it awesome? Buy it here. That's kind of stuff happening. Yeah. Right. 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 Understandable. And, and, of course, Evolved also reps a lot of um, well-known content creators and streamers. Um, just wondering if there's anything to be said from that angle about um, approaches that people have attempted to fight counterfeiting in that uh, piece of the market. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, ET has a sister company, uh, which is a law firm um, that does a, a lot of brand protection work uh, for a lot of our clients. We can't, we're not, you know, related to hip, but we refer them over and say, Hey, they do brand protection. And, and certainly not all of our creators use, uh, that law firm, but uh, a lot of them do. And, you know, we do the, that brand protection for them. And it typically is the larger creators who have, you know, people ripping their content, uploading it to YouTube. Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily like a, a counterfeit merchandising problem. It's much more of a, like a bootleg, uh, content problem where people will rip their Twitch streams, copy their YouTube videos and upload them to other channels and kind of like take a, you know, a streamer's uh, Twitch and cut it up, put it on TikTok. And they're not even like pretending to be that streamer. They're just taking good content, putting it on their own account and getting millions of views and all kinds of stuff. And that's, you know, requires a, a brand protection, you know, uh, agency or, or, you know, technology to go after and find those and, and take them down, you know, with, with video fingerprinting and that kind of stuff. And that's, you know, that's a big challenge with some of our largest clients for sure. Um, and then, you know, there's absolutely the bootleg merchandise stuff going up on, you know, the Zazzles and Amazon for some of our bigger clients as well for just people trying to make a quick buck. Impersonating on social is also huge among that crowd. Right, right. Thank you. I think it might make sense to to push it over to Derek for a few minutes um, because Derek, so if we're, if, if we're talking about the way that people approach, you know, attacking this problem, um, now, now would be a great time for you to sort of share a little bit about your secret sauce and what Vantage BP does, how it does it, and the effects, the, the, uh, the, the successes that you continue to have. Yeah, thanks, Nate. Um, just to, earlier on, on Duncan's point, I actually, I definitely agree that building a better quality product is definitely deterrence, right? If you start adding the complexity to the products, it does make it harder to counterfeit. And there is a difference, right? That a fan comes to a game, he sees somebody wearing a better quality thing. Yeah, there is a difference and it, it is a major deterrence. So I, I definitely agree with Duncan there. Um, yeah, but with our service, like, look, I mean, we have an automated technology that scans over 160 marketplaces looking for this stuff on the daily basis, right? We were looking for, like Adrian mentioned earlier, he's looking for keywords, he's looking for product names, he's looking for players' names, um, he's looking for certain things that yield listing results. And then we basically have technology that goes through those listings, looking, vetting them, seeing if they're false positives, seeing if they're positives. If they are positive matches, then we send out notices to find out, hey, are you selling legitimate good? And if they don't respond after three business days, then boom, we go straight to enforcement, right? We take it down. So it is a, it's a multi-layered process. It's not even just scanning. It's, it's vetting the people, making sure that they are authentic, making sure they're unauthentic, and then taking it to the enforcement step. But I can't stress this enough that, you know, you can't leverage a service like us if you don't have a strong legal foundation. If you don't have the IP, you don't have the trademarks, you're not going to be, it's just not going to work. And that's why, you know, even if these teams, you know, haven't gotten to that stage where, you know, they have a lot of fans yet, but, you know, they're maybe a year out or two years out or whatever it is. I mean, it takes a year to get a trademark. So register your team's name, you know, get that IP in motion. So by the time, you know, you start rising in popularity, then at least you'll have that foundation in place that you'll be able to leverage a service like us or be able to enforce it yourself because you have those registered marks, right? If you don't have them, you're basically at a loss. And again, this is not, you know, you register for a share mark tomorrow and you get it the next day. It's a multi-month process. And Nate, I'm sure you can speak to that a little bit more, but um, it takes time. And, and once you have that legal foundation in place, then boom, now you can leverage a service like us. And to an earlier point that Adrian mentioned, which I thought was pretty interesting, um, if you have merch, build it in a store on, on Amazon, right? Build that authorized place that your fans can go to and buy your stuff. So then you can start creating that separation of, okay, what's legit and what's not. 
right? Very important. If you do have IP in place, a lot of times these marketplaces actually have the, their own brand protection like platforms that you can basically register your IP on and then file takedowns yourself. Yeah, it's, it's, it takes a lot of time and, and maybe for like the one-offs, the two-offs, it works. Um, but yeah, obviously once you start dealing with thousands of takedowns, then you, you, know, you would want to use a service to automate it. But in the beginning, if you are you know, registering your stuff, protecting yourself on these marketplaces and filing single takedowns, it's a deterrence. So then counterfeiters know that, okay, maybe this isn't a brand that I want to mess with. Right, so getting ahead of it early before it becomes a massive problem later on is going to save you a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of cost. Right, um, so definitely be preventative, and, and I think an IP portfolio is, is the way to do it. Yeah, Derek, is it, it, it if I understand uh, well, as I as I know from from my uh, very wonderful collaboration with you, it's it's always a pleasure. Um, these platforms look for you to show the money. They 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 look for you to show. In, in, the, in, in your industry, the money is the trademark registration. Uh, show us that you have uh, registered trademark rights, right? Can you, can you say just, just, just briefly about, um, you know, dealing with the, the platforms? Yeah, if you don't have the IP, it's not gonna work. I mean, the thing is with copyrights, and uh, this is actually an earlier point that Duncan brought up, um, is we are seeing um, pe people basically take snippets of YouTube videos of content, right? And then try to repost it as their own. In those situations, you are protected by copyright, right? You don't need to register the copyright. You're protected by copyright because somebody stole, you know, something that you made and that makes sense, right? But when you come to dealing with, you know, Face Clan logos or Cloud9 logos or different ways of shapes of the logos, I mean, if you don't have trademarks in place, you can't file a copyright takedown against it, right? You have to file a trademark infringement action and the marketplace will just reject your complaint. They won't do anything about it, no matter how, you know, you know, it just won't work. So again, trademarks are your strongest way to battle this stuff. Um, start in the US, you don't need to get trademarks everywhere around the world, but start in the US, that's your strongest defense. And then from there, gradually say, okay, maybe let's move to China. Okay, now let's move to South America, right? Let's start expanding and investing. But again, a trademark is really only a couple thousand bucks. Get it in the US, just get your team's mark. Um, otherwise, even another team could steal your mark and that would be even worse, right? So just get ahead of it and uh, get, it, get the ball rolling and, and spend the money and make it happen. Yeah, this is this is a unique industry for the additional reason that I, I can't think of that many other industries where there's so much strong brand out there that is not yet protected the way it should be in terms of registration. I think it might make sense to uh, switch gears a little bit and take some questions that have been rolling in from the viewers. Um, I want to start with this one, which is really interesting. Um, uh, as as Experts in the field, which crypto token, if any, do you see as the leader or most likely to dominate the virtual world? Um, let's 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 not spend. That's a very intriguing question, but let's um, not spend too much time on it, just because I want to focus to the extent possible on counterfeiting. Does anybody have any view on that? If no, I'll move on to the next one. Stuff like t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stick with okay. Uh, Doge you know, I, I genuinely, if yeah. If you're an good. investor, buy lots of Doge. So there, my, yeah, there you go. We'll we'll leave it at that. It's a very interesting question. I like it, but okay. Let's move to the next one. No, it's a very interesting question. Um, let's talk about here. This is a very interesting one. Um, is there an issue with so? There's an issue with counterfeit jerseys. We've been talking about jerseys a fair amount, but what about? Esports streetwear. Is there a noticeable yeah. difference between production of counterfeit streetwear versus counterfeit jerseys? Definitely. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, the, you know, the 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 Teespring stuff. You know, it's just like really bad quality knockoff T-shirts with your logo on the front. Versus, you know, where where we're trying to level up is that we, you know, definitely think about rather than just doing the screen print. You know, like what kind of what what how do we level up the the actual graphic itself? Um, you know, we're, we're using, you know, high density print or, or rubberized, um, you know, print methods, um, you know, to sort of add, add texture and detail to, to the product. Um, uh, leveling up our trim packs. So the, 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 the woven labels, the, the internal um, neck labels and neck liners, um, anything that we can do to sort of add that extra 10% that makes it really challenging, like Derek was, like Duncan was saying, to, to be able to replicate or it's not worth their time and effort to replicate versus just sticking a screen print on a front of a t-shirt. Um, that's, that's the area where we, we think we can kind of catch the, 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 the fakes from the real is, is through the trim and through the, the that extra 10%. Um, 
Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, and just a, you know, um, I, one thing I've noticed is, you know, the hundred thieves in phase when they make a white t-shirt or a white sweatshirt, you know, the big, big hoodies, they're not pure white. They're an eggshell. They're an off shade that isn't a commonly wholesale uh, blank, meaning like it's not a Gildan, it's not a independent trading company, it's not a Nexel, it's not a Bella Canvas, it's not any, it's not a shade that is. Whole, manufactured by the hundreds of thousands and sold globally, they find a color that they go and have, you know, custom matched at their factory. And the factory probably isn't going to buy a lot of extra stuff and nobody else is making that very specific shade of white that's noticeable or whatever color, red, green, blue, purple, so that when people try to make the bootlegs and their only available blank is a white one or a cream or a tan, it just looks wrong. And that's a not, in a, it's not terribly expensive to do that because they're making enough that it makes sense to go get, you know, custom colored uh, uh, blanks made, but it's not available to other people because no factory is really going to take a large bootleg order. It's just, that's, that's, a you know, people do it, but it, you know, it's, hard, it's much harder for counterfeiters to do that as easy as to make custom colors like that. And so it's just, it's just adding things that are much harder to do, but it's also really easy to identify when someone you're like a block away and you're like, that's a, that is a fake face hoodie. That is pure white. That's a Gildan, you know, G12,000 hoodie. It's not whatever custom one they had made. And so that's a relatively easy way to identify streetwear and also for the streetwear makers to, you know, put something cool in it because no one sells that shade. Great. Interesting. I think we may have time for one more question before I turn it back over to Jason. Um, and the question is, uh, what is more of a challenge? Current merchandise costs being prohibitive or IP infringement on services such as Zazzle? I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think, I don't think manufacturing is as prohibitive. I, I, I think it, it's, it's short it's look long-term versus short-term, right? I mean, you know, block and tackle in front of you, can you afford to, to stand up a, a merchandise line versus the long game of actually protecting your brand long-term? If you know that you're going to be, if you, if you know that you're going to, if you know that as a brand, you're, you're, you're going to, you know, you obviously you have every intention to exist, you know, for, for the foreseeable future, right? I mean, I think, you know, the investment in actually protecting your brand from the outset is, probably equally as important as, as standing up a merchandise line, but it's, it's, you know, to, to, to Derek's point, it, it can take a year plus to actually successfully register a, a logo or, or a trademark. Right. So, um, you know, you've almost got a parallel path, both of, both of them to, to, to get to the end, to get to the end result. Um, but short term, you know, if you want, I mean, it's, I think it's I think I think it's equally important, but you've got a parallel path both, and you've got to remember that it's going to take you over a year to get to get there on IP registration, right? So, right. Yeah, and I think you know when you're starting out, uh, doing custom construction is expensive and prohibitive, takes a much longer time, uh, has much higher startup costs, and you've got to buy more of them, and it's a big inventory risk. So, um, it's you know teams that are starting out are unlikely to be able to really afford to have, you know, stuff that's much more challenging to counterfeit. Um, I think so, you know, having good brand protection from the start means that your screen printed t-shirts, you know, can be, you know, you'll, you'll be dry, you'll be selling most of those globally instead of counterfeiters. Whereas, you know, maybe save the cool custom stuff for later when you're more established and have the budget to do so. Great. Thank you. Um, guys, I think, uh, I think we're, just about out of time, but I wanted to really thank you all, uh, Duncan, Derek, Adrian. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. It's been a great conversation. Uh, and uh, I, I hope that uh, the folks out there watching uh, learned a lot today, because I certainly did. Jason? Thank you, Nate, Adrian, Duncan, Derek, Nate. I'd like to thank you for being our panelists and moderator. And I'd like to thank each of your organizations as well, Cloud9, Evolved Talent Agency, Vantage VP, Zuber Lawler, Everyone here at eHorizon, thanks you for attending today. 
And please feel free to reach out via our website at ehorizon.gg should you have any questions or if you think we can help your venture in esports. And we'll be sending a follow up email so you can reach each of our uh, each of our panelists and moderator individually as well. So thank you very much for attending. Jason, thanks, Nate. Thanks, everyone. <clears throat>